Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, but we do. It's the first Sunday in Advent, and we give you thanks for being a part of our worship. November 29th, 2020, thanks for watching and being a part of it. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and we ask God's forgiveness of our sins. Let's do so now. Almighty God, we come this morning as a broken people. We have turned our lives from your path. We do wrong against each other. We are idle in the face of poverty and the pain of those around us. We leave when we should stay. We talk when we should listen. We stiffen when we should bend. We fall asleep when we should be vigilant. We cannot take what is wrong in our lives and make it right. So here and now, we confess our sins. And we confess our need for your grace. In your mercy, with tenderness, hear our cries, heal our wounds, bind our hearts, and make us your people once again and forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn to God and he listens. In his mercy, he's given his son Jesus Christ to die for us. And he promises to bestow his Holy Spirit on all who believe in him. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down, how the mountains would quake in your presence, as fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your glory. When you came down long ago, you did awesome things beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you, who works these who wait for him. You welcome those who cheerfully do good, who follow godly ways. But we are not godly. We are consistent sinners. So your anger is heavy on us. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and pure with sin. When we proudly display our righteous deeds, we are fine, but they are filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins, like the wind, sweep us away. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. And yet, Lord, you are our Father. You are the potter and we are the clay. Formed by your hand, don't be angry with us, Lord. Please, don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see us all as your people. And the epistle lesson is 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from, our, from, from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I give... Thanks to my God for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of, it, of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gifts as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you Till the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that ends our lesson. The gospel for this, the first Sunday of Advent, is taken from Mark chapter 13, starting at the verse, the 24th verse. Jesus warns his disciples and us that the day is coming. When asked at the, about the end of the world, Jesus told his disciples, at that time, after all those horrible days are over, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from the sky, and all the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man arrive on the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send forth his angels to gather together his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of earth and heaven. Now, learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its buds become tender and its leaves begin to sprout, you know without being told 
that summer is near. Just so, when you see the events I've described begin to happen, you can be sure his return is very near, right at the door. I assure you, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these events have taken place. Heaven and earth may disappear, but my words will remain forever. However, no one will know the day or the hour when these will happen. Not the angels in heaven or even the Son himself, only the Father knows. So since you don't know when any of this will happen, stay alert, keep watch. The coming of the Son of Man can be compared to a man who left home and went on a trip. He gave each of his servants instructions about the work they were to do and told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. So keep a sharp lookout, for you do not know when the homeowner will return, evening, midnight, early dawn, or late daybreak. When he arrives without warning, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Thus says the Lord through his prophet, as the snow and the rain come down from heaven and return not, but water the earth, making it break forth and sprout, bringing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to be empty, but shall accomplish that for which I have directed and succeed in the purposes that I have in mind. O oh Lord, let this so happen today through your servant. Amen. Kids these days have no idea about the wishbone. When I was a kid, it was an age-old family tradition, kind of like the day after Amen to the Thanksgiving feast. My sister Vicky and I would grab hold of one end of each and pull, and whoever got the big middle chunk, ta-da, your wish is granted. Apparently, this is no longer done that often. found that out last year at preschool chapel where I had to try to explain the whole ritual and the whys behind it, and they didn't seem to get it. But the more I thought about that, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, quite frankly, the whole idea doesn't make a lot of sense. That a broken bone from a devoured turkey has the ability to grant wishes? That stipulation that you're not allowed to tell anybody what you wished for or it would never come true? Or the unspecified timing? I was told, don't worry, your wish will come true. Well, I tell you, in 1965, I won and I wished for a sled and I still haven't gotten it. Oh, I just told you, so I guess I blew that. And above all, there's just the simple matter of physics. If you are wishing on a wishbone, the closer you come to the middle, the almost guaranteed to be the winner and come out on top. But despite all this, more importantly, I think the problem is, is the world needs less wishing and more hope. Now personally, I made a list. I find myself yearning for a whole bunch of things that there will be a peaceful transition of power in the presidency, that somehow the vaccines and all the testings will end up getting us back to normal sometime next year, that we put an end to racism, that the Seahawks' defense finally shows up for a football game, that I'm going to make the right choice of all the multiplicity of options at Medicare Advantage plans. I'm not sure which of all these desires constitute hope and which ones are just merely wishes? There's a big difference between wishing and hope. Wishing is something we all do. Projecting what we want or feel we need into the future. Sometimes it's, it's what we work for, but usually it kind of sort of is something we hope somebody else will grant us. We all have wish lists especially this time of year. But our wishes are usually predominantly all about us, even the best ones, where we wish for something holy or noble, or we, we wish for something for someone else. They're still centered on our own egos. It's what we think should be happening. Hope, however, is always oriented to what God is doing. 
what he wants. Eugene Peterson had this wonderful analogy to highlight the difference between wishing and hope. He said, imagine wishes as a line that's going straight from you with an arrow at the end. It's pointing to the future. It's the thing you want to have happen. Hope, he says, is the opposite of that. Hope is a line that comes straight from God out of the future with the arrow pointing to us. It's not so much what we want, but what God wants us to receive. Which way is your arrow pointing? Hope means leaving yourself wide open to wonder, to being surprised. Because if it is God's doing, if we trust that he knows what's best for us in our lives and how we might work for the better of the world around us, we might not know at all where our hope might take us. Hope is intrinsically future-oriented. Sure, it's the expectation of what is not yet realized or possessed and not necessarily guaranteed, which means sometimes in our cultivating hope, we have to do without our wishes. And that brings us to Advent. <laughs> this is my favorite season. There's something about it that, that makes it the best time of year for me. It has to be hope. And perhaps more this year than any other, we really need to hope. The season begins with a very telling passage, Isaiah 64. Isaiah expresses his and Israel's hope, starting out saying, Oh, if you would only rip open the heavens, O Lord, and come down. Now, how many of us have actually kind of felt that way this year? God, things are so bad in so many ways, only you can fix it. What are you waiting for? Because that is what Isaiah is asking. For God to stir things up, to mess with the world, to turn it upside down. It's not a wish, but a hope to let God have his way. Now, unless you think the prophet is just all about getting those other nations to get theirs, you've got to note how he ends this whole section. With the acknowledgement, you are the potter, we're merely clay. And then the plea... <laughs> Don't be really angry with us. Please bear in mind that we are still your people. That's his hope. That God's face will be revealed. That his people will be aroused. He's looking to the future, holding his breath, waiting, as Peterson would say, for God's arrow. Where does that kind of hope come from? Well, the quick and obvious answer is, is God, of course. But knowing that actually puts me in a somewhat awkward position. I find myself hoping for hope, waiting for it, as if it's something out there, beyond me, eluding me, out of my control, which is true, but not completely. If it is God's, given to me, to provide direction, to inspire courage. It's a gift, but a gift given to me to be shared. Peter Block, in his really intriguing book, The Answer to How is Yes, poses a question. Are you more a consumer or a producer of hope? I find that distinction profound. Maybe we should be both. Hope is something we need to get and have validated by God. But it's also something we should be offering to anyone and everyone we come into contact with. I think it's pretty easy to be a hope consumer. That even might be our human default position. We seek it all the time from our parents, our friends, a doctor, a sports team, economists, the government, or those that are against the government. But just think instead how cool it would be if hope was not just something we need to get for ourselves, but just as equally something we provide to others. Paul tells the Romans 
It is hope in which we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, but who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we can wait for it with patience. We hope for what we cannot see. That's not wishing. It doesn't mean that hope has to be less practical and down to earth than what our eyes tell us. Just that if it is a divine gift embedded in us by God himself, it should do something to us and inspire in us a contagious reaction in all that we encounter. Especially in Advent. So yeah, I think we can do without the make do without the uh, wishbone celebration thing. Because there's another tradition this time of year that I prefer because I really hold dear. That of the Advent wreath. Each year, lighting that first candle, the candle of hope, I think back to Isaiah and all those other prophets. They were strengthened by hope. Hope that would not be realized for hundreds of years until the cry of a newborn baby in a small Judean town would fulfill them. My hopes are just as far-fetched as theirs, just as unclear, and yet they find strength in them. They do something for me. That's where it all starts, not where it ends. So in the midst of all the loose ends, the anxieties, the worries about the present and the future we have, despite that all-too-human temptation to wait until something actually glimmers realistically before we start to dare hope, I want to be like Isaiah, confident enough in my hope to ask God to stir things up. I want to trust that my Lord and Savior has got something in mind for me, even if I have no idea what that may be. That he is gently and tenderly cradling my hopes in his arms like a baby swaddled in a manger. That's the promise of Advent. That God's strength meets us in the midst of our weakness, that his certainty overrides our doubt, that he lights up our lives so that we wait for what we cannot yet see but know is coming. That's not wishing. That's hope. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Walking in the light to the coming Savior, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who await the dawning of God's kingdom. We pray. Your people long for the light of your presence, O God. Enlighten your church with servants who yearn to lead your people in love. Equip us with your Holy Spirit to meet all the challenges ahead with faith, hope, and trust in you. The whole world longs for your light of your presence, O God. The justice and truth you shine upon us is more than just needed. May peace prevail in our land and among all the nations. Bless your people with hearts of love and compassion, the heart you have for everyone, that even those with whom we disagree might experience the gift of love for them through us. Fill all the places of loss and sadness with echoes of your promise to make all things new and whole again. Strengthen our faith, O oh Father that we might be truly thankful in a unique and profound way 
this year as we see our lives through and all the years to come, striving for not just a new normal, but a living, breeding incarnation of your love for us. O oh God, your household of faith longs for the soothing light of your healing touch, and we ask that it fall upon your people. May the brightness of your mercy be upon all the sick or suffering, all those awaiting treatments or recovering or, or facing death, especially those we think of right now. We give you thanks for sharers and caregivers, that their generosity, their patience, and their strength will illuminate those in the darkness of despair, reflecting your light on the shadows of this earth. The whole company of heaven lives in the joy of your endless light, O oh God, and, and we give you thanks. May we remember those who have passed before us, those whom we miss, with all the faithful departed, and yearn for that day where we are all united under the shadow of your love, basking in the light of your unveiled glory. Show us your light, O oh God, and guide us ever closer to you in our walk of life. This, as in everything else, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. O oh Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive then the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. That's our worship for today. If things look sort of weird, it's a bit discombobulated around here. We have a special speaker coming this Sunday, and we're going to tape this service for this Sunday, even though it's for the next Sunday as well. So the announcements and all this are sort of strange, but bear with us. We have never been an organized religion in this church, in this congregation. A couple of announcements we do want to say is that we have a really cool thing coming up um, sometime between December 13th and 25th. We're calling it 30-mile uh, Christmas style. And instead of what we do every August where we have all these projects and work parties and stuff helping, we want people to identify needs in the community, in our congregation, and friends. And whatever that need is, to kind of submit it to either Sarah or myself or the office. And we want to meet those needs. We want to help people where it can be. So if you check our website, we'll have a lot more details on this, but this gives us an opportunity to show Christ's love in a very particular way to people that, that might otherwise have a less than Merry Christmas or struggle a bit more than they have to. The needs could be uh, food, it could be uh, support, could be visiting, could be anything. Um, think about it, look around you, open your eyes and see where you can shed God's light on other people. As always, office is open and everything is going. We're starting a brand new Bible study on Revelation, Zoom, starting this Wednesday and at 10 o'clock. So if you want to be a part of that, um, give me an email and we'll get you on that list. Um, everything else, stay tuned. We'll have some Advent devotions online to be posted. We'll have all this other stuff going. And next week, which could be this week, but really next week, but it's coming up is... is uh, Dick and Crystal Perello, who do missionary work in Rwanda, are going to talk about their great work and, and how it bears fruit with both the medical community and the religious training of others. So stay tuned for that as well. In the meantime, as we begin this Advent season of hope, may it shine in your hearts and you be patient and loving to those around us waiting for our Messiah. God bless you. Amen.